Hi there, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for our webinar with Test Force and Tektronix on the importance of inverter motor drives and how to easily analyze them. We thank you for your attention and participation today. If you have any feedback or other webinar topic suggestions for the future, then please let me know by chat or you can email us later at marketing at testforce.com. Before we get started, I'd just like to let everyone know that this webinar will be recorded and you'll be receiving an email afterwards with a copy of the recording. So you can go ahead and share it with anyone you think would be interested or rewatch it if you'd like. If you're interested in any of the other webinars we'll be hosting or to download any of the free resources we have available, such as white papers or application notes, please go ahead and visit testforce.com academy and you'll find everything you need right there. So during the webinar, if you have any questions, make sure you ask them in the Q&A section in the right side menu bar, and we will be sure to get to all of those questions as we get to the end of the presentation. Omer, our presenter, will be available uh, to answer all of your questions. And now I'd like to introduce Omer Sheik. He's a field applications engineer for Tektronix, specializing in RF, high speed and power applications. Let's jump right in and talk about inverter motor drive analysis. So welcome everybody, glad you can join me today. So as uh, you know, Chris has introduced me, I'm the uh, application engineer and manager for EMEA at Tektronix. I have been in the test and measurement industry for nearly a decade now and have worked as an application engineer for most of it specializing in power analysis and high-speed serial analysis applications. Uh, and today I'll be talking about uh, three-phase motor drive analysis techniques um, uh, using an oscilloscope and how you would go about making those measurements on a scope uh, rather than a traditional power analyzer. So here's the agenda. We'll be looking at a overview of a typical motor drive circuit. Uh, then we'll be looking at types of motors followed by uh, measurements for three-phase power testing, uh, where you can do static and dynamic measurements on scope. Uh, the importance of choosing the right test equipment to do your measurements, that's always important, so we're going to be talking a little bit about that. Um, in the end, for the presentation part, I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, impact of galvanically isolated probes, uh, which is a unique solution um, uh, for, for, for some of the key uh, technology semiconductor work that's basically going on nowadays. Uh, and in the end, we'll do a live demo um, of the, looking at the performance of a three phase uh, brushless DC motor on the scopes. We'll be sharing that. So, the first is overview of a typical motor drive circuit. Uh, so, to understand a typical motor drive circuit, we can look at a VFD or a variable frequency drive. Uh, this is used for running an AC motor at variable speeds um, or ramp up the motor for a smooth startup. Uh, they work by adjusting the frequency to control the speed of the motor. So a very basic definition of what a variable frequency drive is. Here's a detailed block diagram where a VFD is shown. Uh, and that's the inner parts of it. I mean, we're not showing the, the exact components of here. It's still a block diagram, but it gives an idea of how it works. Um, uh, so, as you, as you will see on the screen over here, the VFD is shown with a converter um, in, at the start that converts three phase AC to DC. Um, the DC bus generates a cleaner filter DC signal, and then it is fed to the inverter, which is basically a combination of transistors, which act as a switch to generate PWM or pulse width modulation signals, with, which control the speed of the motor by changing the frequency um, or the pulse width of the PWM signals. The PWM signals at the output of the drive circuit uh, basically is simulated AC. So as you can see in, in the block diagram over here, the output, you know, we're converting DC to AC and you have a simulated AC waveform in the form of this um, three-level PWM um, uh, uh, signal, and that get, gets fed into each phase of the motor in case of, in this case, we're testing a three-phase motor. So there are various measurements that can be made at different points of the entire circuit from the start till the end. As you will see in this block diagram, we have points one to four. So for example, engineers will be interested in making power quality measurements, which include RMS voltage and currents, crest factor, power factor, and all the different powers uh, at both the three phase AC input drive and output stages. There would be interest to measure any AC ripple on the DC bus voltage as well. So we're gonna talk a bit about that later. 
The control circuitry incorporates uh, various other electronics of the motor drive circuit design and will include a microprocessor that would uh, be controlling sensors and various other components. Uh, the circuitry could consist of low speed serial buses, such as CAN bus I squared C and SPI. Um, it, it, uh, it will also have the control circuitry for the gate drive signals for each transistor in the inverter and converter stages. Lastly, engineers would be interested in making efficiency measurements between the output and input as well. That's not all actually when it comes to, you know, making the measurements of a complete drive system. There's, there's a lot more into it. There's stuff in between that you have to measure as well. Uh, that would be of importance if in case you're trying to debug an issue. So we're going to look at a few other measurements that are made in between on the next slide. So here I'm just showing uh, uh, the innards of uh, the uh, the converter and the inverter stage. So you've got AC or DC at the input of uh, of the circuit, and then you have the the rest of the part on the right hand side is the is the inverter stage where DC gets converted into the AC that gets fed into the motor. So there's a lot of measurements that you can make in between, and uh, some of those will be analyzing the seven transistors, as you can see over here in in this diagram. Uh, you might want to analyze the characteristics of these semiconductors. Uh, you'll be in, maybe interested in, in analyzing uh, or, or doing timing sw and switching analysis, which includes switching losses, conduction losses, um, uh, dynamic RDS on. Uh, you might want to look at the PWM pulse weights that are, that are being applied on the gates of these transistors. You might be interested in doing some magnetic analysis uh, because you know magnetics is a really crucial part of a power circuitry. So you might want to see if everything is running as per expected, especially if your magnet chosen magnetics that are you that you are using are correct. Um, there's other things that you can do in, in the, you know from in the AC to DC stage. You can do control loop analysis, which includes frequency response analysis, power supply rejection ratio, and so on. Um, you might want to look at the harmonics of uh, uh, of the input supply. You might want to look at the inrush currents. Uh, uh, you might want to look at the line ripple uh, and switching ripple of your DC output. And you also might, might want to do some total harmonic distortion testing, which includes um, testing against certain compliances like IEC 61000, uh, MIL standard 1399, AM14, and so on. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot you can do in terms of measurements from the input of a drive circuitry to the output of it. Um, and, you know, using an oscilloscope, for example, for all these measurements, it's a key instrument that can actually do a lot of things. Um, so one of the things that we are talking about today, of course, is making three phase power measurements at the output. So we're going to focus on that later. Uh, different types of motors. So uh, here are some basic motor types. You have uh, simple DC motors, and then you have three phase motors as well, which include induction motors, brushless DC motors, PMSM motors. Uh, and then you also have stepper motors, which are used for precise positioning. So that's uh, just basics of uh, the different types of motors. <clears throat> Here are the various types of motors classified by design technology. So there are BLDC motors, which are used in consumer electronics and drones, and these offer higher speed ranges and efficiencies. Then you have induction motors used in industrial applications, which is why these are mechanically robust and can work in hazardous conditions. Uh, then there's also the PMSM motor, usually found in fans and compressors uh, that offer higher torque and, uh, and better performance. Uh, and in the end, there's also universal motors used in white goods. And then lastly, there is stepper motors that is used in robotics and industrial automation. So uh, th these in particular are low cost and very reliable, uh, with a simple and rugged construction. Uh, so let's look at some uh, measurements for three phase power testing. So first of all, just a brief uh, basic introduction, which you probably would already know from your days at uh, uh, doing electrical engineering at university or you might do this for a living as well. Um, uh, at, at the power station or the grid, an electrical generator converts mechanical power into a set of three AC electric voltages or currents. Uh, each resulting voltage or current vector has a magnitude and phase, um, and all three vectors rotate at a frequency of either 50 or 60 hertz. That's a line frequency depending upon which country you live in. Um, a three-phase system is considered to be balanced if all the phases are separated by 120 degrees, uh, the vectors have equal magnitude, and the sum of all three phases is zero at neutral. So these are the three conditions at which 
a three-phase system is set to be balanced. And as you can see, we have a diagram of the vectors over here. You've got three phases, A2, uh, B2, and C2 in this case, all separated by 120 degrees. Um, and in the in the middle, if you you know if you if you want to say make a measurement between these three phases, there are different configurations you can use. You can measure between the 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 lines over here, so A2 and B2, for example. If you want to make a measurement, a voltage measurement between those two lines, that'll basically mean you're making a line to line voltage measurement. Or if you just want to make a measurement between the line and the neutrals to get per phase measurements, you will then make a, uh, make a connection of probe, for example, if you're using a scope uh, between the line and the neutral, if it's available uh, to make per phase measurements. So this is how the, the general analogy goes of uh, AC voltage and currents. And keep in mind that there will be vectors for voltages and vectors for currents. There will be some sort of uh, an angle between them as well. We're going to look at, look at uh, a bit more on, uh, of uh, phase diagrams later in the demo. So uh, there are two basic uh, uh, three phase configurations, Y and Delta, uh, as shown in the diagram. A Delta configuration requires only three wires for transmission, uh, but a star configuration may have a fourth wire. So the fourth wire, if present, is provided as a neutral and is normally grounded. The three wire and four wire designations do not count the ground wire present above many transmission lines, which is solely for fault protection uh, and does not carry current under normal use. A four wire system with symmetrical voltages between phase and neutral is obtained when the neutral is connected to the common star point uh, of a supply wi uh, winding. Uh, in such a system, all three phases will have the same magnitude of voltage relative to the neutral. Um, there is a 2V, 2I configuration. So when we, when we say 2V, 2I or 3V, 3I, that basically means you're using uh, two voltage um, probes uh, and two current probes or three voltage and three current probes to make a connection between the lines for the measurement. So uh, a 2V, 2I configuration utilizes two voltage and two current probes uh, to make three phase measurements. This is called the two watt meter method as well, as you might know. And it uses two voltage measurements reference to the same uh, phase or line and the two currents flowing into that phase. Um, the assumption is that the three phase system is balanced. Um, that is the summation of all voltages at neutral is zero volts as I explained in the, in the slide earlier. Uh, and the summation of all the currents is, is equal to zero amps. So this is true if there is no leakage current from neutral to ground. The 3V3I configuration is called three watt meter method uses uh, and it uses three voltage and three current probes to make three phase measurements in this configuration. Uh, you can make per phase uh, measurements reference to a neutral if it is available in case of a star configuration. If it is a delta configuration where neutral is not present, you make voltage measurements between uh, phases and also, uh, which is also known as line to line voltages. Uh, there are a couple of other wiring configurations as well, which are not on the slide over here, but I'll talk about that briefly. There's one phase two wire, uh, which uses um, one voltage and one current probe. In this case, uh, you are probing between line to neutral, and this is normally a connection or wiring configuration for measuring a DC bus um, of the drive. Then there's one phase three wire as well, which uses two voltage and two current probes. And in this case, the voltages and currents are probed uh, between line to neutral. Uh, and this selection would only be available for the input of the drive. It's just a bit, bit of information about uh, wiring configurations. IMDA measurements. So IMDA is the name of the software that we have on our scope that makes uh, automated three-phase uh, power measurements. So I'm just going to touch on that just to uh, describe what it does. And then you're going to see more of it later when we make some, some measurements on this brushless DC three-phase motor I have on my desk here. So uh, the solution basically has uh, input analysis. You can do power quality and phase diagram um, measurements with that. You can look at those plots. You can do total harmonic distortion measurements. Uh, you can look at out for, for the output. You can look at efficiencies. Uh, you can look at um, uh, ripple for, for ripple analysis. And there are different wiring configurations available to you as well uh, from, from using 1V, 1I, uh, to up to 3V, 3I with different types of wiring configurations. You can choose whichever one you need. You can start making your measurements. Uh, just so you have to just specify what your connections are in the configuration of the software. And depending upon what measurement you want to make, you can just go ahead and choose that and, and make your measurements. And so we're going to have a look at that later. Um, you can get a detailed report uh, as well at the end of your measurements. You can do that using scope. Uh, you can make two types of measurements using a scope. It's either static or dynamic measurements. We're going to look at that a bit later. Uh, mechanical measurements is something that uh, you can't, can't do with 
our scope software at this stage, but it is planned for the future release. Uh, it's going to come soon. So just a bit of an overview of the software. Uh, talking a bit about static measurements, uh, we have uh, input uh, or output analysis for power quality. So that's what you would get. Basically, you would capture your three phase uh, voltage and currents on the scope. Uh, you would set up the software so it can make the measurements over here. You can see we're making measurements of RMS voltage and currents, crest factors, all the powers, power factor, and so on on the right hand side in this badge. Uh, you can see all the waveforms on the screen as well and some associated math waveforms as well. And then on the left hand side, you have a phaser diagram associated uh, with your, your voltage capture showing all the different angles between the, the voltages, currents, and, um, and between the phases as well. Um, secondly, you can do harmonics analysis. Now, why is this important? Why is it necessary? Uh, normally, non-ideal input currents increase burden on the power grid and waste energy. So ideally, when the power factor is equal to one, the load appears resistive. Um, uh, uh, and in this case, the voltage and current is going to be in phase. So you'll see that on the phase diagram if that's the case. So um, uh, real power, apparent power, and relative power in that case is zero. So there are no current harmonics. So this is an ideal um, uh, situation. But in practice, loads are not always resistive. So AC to DC convert is present nonlinear impedance, uh, and power factor correction is complex. So you'll be interested in total harmonic distortion, which is a measurement that tells you how much of this, the distortion of a voltage or current is due to harmonics in the signal. THD, uh, or total harmonic distortion, it's a short form of it, is an important aspect in power systems and should typically, but not always, be as low as possible. Uh, one of the standards that you, you normally test for safety compliance against is the IEC 61003-2 uh, that deals with limitation of harmonic currents injected into the power supply system. So if you want to do uh, that pre-compliance measurement as well, you can do that on the scope. Uh, ripple analysis, uh, in, in this case with one volt, uh, one V1I configuration, wiring configuration, uh, you can do that as well. So ripple uh, in a simple form is the AC voltage that is superimposed onto the DC output uh, of a power supply. Uh, oftentimes when, the dry, uh, when a drive system trips uh, on under voltage or over voltage, it becomes necessary to measure the DC bus voltage. However, it is suspected that the DC voltage sensing circuit is, is, is malfunctioning, then it may be required to measure the DC bus voltage itself. Um, so the DC bus voltage in a drive will uh, be much higher than its AC RMS input voltage. Um, this should be kept in mind when attempting to measure the DC voltage. So here you can see a typical drive schematic. Um, you will notice that neither end of the DC bus capacitor is at ground potential. So using a high voltage differential probe is recommended in this case because you don't want to uh, be in a situation where you create a ground loop between um, your device and your test and the scope and which will cause huge damage not only the test equipment also harm yourself. So it's better that in this configuration uh, when you know that your ground is not really ground and your, uh, you know, your ground potential is floating. Uh, just use a high voltage differential probe that's always recommended and that's what you typically use with an oscilloscope or in most cases what i've seen is that people also use battery powered oscilloscopes because that would mean you have an isolated ground between your device and a test and your measurement system uh, so this is how ripple analysis basically looks like you you capture the ripple um, on on the scope by using AC coupling uh, you can or DC reject depending upon what you have on the probe uh, and you can look at RMS um, current and peak to peak current um, and that's that's being measured over here in this case so um, I mean uh, when you look at a ripple in this way yes looking at peak to peak and RMS makes sense and that gives you um, a good idea into whether you are within uh, specification limits or not. But since you have an oscilloscope, uh, you can go the extra mile and convert this time domain waveform into a frequency domain waveform by doing an FFT, and then actually try to see may, what are the main sources of this ripple. So the, the FFT can actually give you a much more clearer picture. So if you want to do that, an oscilloscope is the perfect tool to be able to do that. Um, output analysis, so uh, looking at efficiency measurements, that's always something that um, motor drive engineers are interested in and want to see. Uh, the ratio of output power to the input power, respective of uh, the input voltage and, and current pairs. Uh, so you can you can easily do that on the scope as well, provided you have enough number of channels. If you have a situation where you have an input as a DC and and an output as AC, uh, that's a perfect scenario because that means for the DC bus you only need 
one pair of voltage and current probes, whereas for a three-phase output, you will need three pairs of voltage and current probes. Um, so an eight-channel oscilloscope is perfect for that sort of a measurement. Or in that, uh, or, or what you can do is if you have um, a three-phase AC input and a three-phase AC output, and you're measuring AC to AC, uh, then you can use um, two voltage and current probes for the input, two voltage and current probes for the output to uh, connect to an eight-channel oscilloscope. And using the two watt meter method, basically you can calculate the efficiency. Um, so that's how a typical efficiency measurement capture would look like on the scope. Uh, you capture all the waveforms. You have some associated math waveforms here as well, uh, doing the uh, voltage time current to give you power or instantaneous power. You have all the measurements that are being made for the efficiencies, and you can see that on the right-hand side or on this table. Dynamic measurement. So this is the part where an oscilloscope is much more useful uh, because, you know, anything that we looked at on the on the previous slides were static measurements and you can make those measurements easily with the power analyzer which many people tend to do um that's what this scope can also do that but an oscilloscope is useful for making dynamic measurements from the fact that you can capture long acquisitions uh, you know you have deeper memory so you can you can look at startup response of the motor you could look at you know um, a longer uh, lens of information depending upon the deep memory you have available on the scope and because motors are normally running at you know um, uh, lower frequencies uh, you can play around with the sample rate and the record length settings to actually capture a longer uh, time window um, so uh, you can see over here that the time base uh, you can probably not see it actually but the time base is set to one second per division so we're capturing 10 seconds worth of information across the acquisition window and uh, we're dropping the sample rate to 1 million samples per second because the motor was running at about 50 hertz so it's it's, it's doable um uh, so uh if, so you capture a long acquisition and as soon as the motor turns on uh we can capture the full transient response of the motor during the initial stages uh before the motor becomes stable and picks up its desired rpm as required uh, you can look at static three-phase power measurements at any point during an entire acquisition by zooming and gating the measurement to within the zoom window. That is completely possible with, with an oscilloscope. Um, so we use time trend plots to be able to look at those measurements, and I'm going to show that in the demonstration later on. Uh, the second part to um, uh, dynamic measurements is acquisition trend plots or data logging. Uh, this is not something that I have on, on the software version I'm running on my scope today, so I won't be able to show it, but this is a screenshot of how it basically works. So, as I said in the previous acquisition, uh, previous slide, uh, you use time trend plots for capturing long acquisitions, and you can look at how a measurement changes over time by using time trend plots. However, we have um, introduced something called acquisition trend plots as well, and in this case, you don't have to capture a long acquisition, you can just capture a standard acquisition just so you can make your measurements and keep that running. So what happens is that any of the parameters that you're trying to measure, whether it's RMS voltage or current power uh, or anything else, uh, you can see how those measurements are changing um, as, as the oscilloscope is capturing acquisition. So you're basically logging data um, on a per acquisition basis or a per trigger basis. So what you see over here is you've got three plots on the left-hand side. You've got RMS, uh, VRMS for phase one. You've got some of the true powers for phase one and um, current for RMS current for phase one as well. Uh, so what this is basically doing, that it's, it's plotting the measurement as it changes trigger after trigger or acquisition after acquisition. So this is really good from the, from, the, from, uh, from the fact that you can actually use this as a data logger and you can save all this information in a CSV file uh, for offline processing if that's required. So that's, why, that's where acquisition trend plots um, really become useful. Uh, so what do you need uh, for uh, for capturing um, uh, all this uh, information and, and processing it is the best-in-class acquisition system. So we're talking about scopes today, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, high vertical resolution. Uh, so this is uh, a slide where we show um, the oscilloscope that I'm going to be using. So I'm using the A-channel version, which is the MSO58 today, to be able to um, do these measurements. And uh, it, this sort of uh, configuration with eight channels is useful in three-phase power electronics where you're designing uh, inverters or you're, you're looking at motor control, looking at DC to DC power conversion or power supply design, having the extra channels does help. Uh, so this really is a useful uh, tool from that perspective. And uh, gonna talk a bit about um, the, the importance of higher resolution. So this, this oscilloscope that I just showed to you on the previous slide has 12-bit ADCs. 
uh, and a low noise front end amplifier with uh, special design filters to remove the inherent noise of the scope and makes uh, which makes it a better system to look at signals with finer detail and better accuracy. Um, if a uh, it, of course, provides higher E knob as well. So effective number of bits as compared to traditional 8 bit ADC oscilloscopes. Just to see the higher E knob in action, the screenshot over here compares um, uh, um, a uh, or is coming from a 1.5 volt uh, DDR3 power supply. So the left side shows the DDR3 power supply captured by a traditional 8 bit oscilloscope with an E knob of 6 bits. Uh, the supply appears to have some significant noise and some prominent uh, periodic voltage spikes. Uh, the right side of the image um, shows the same supply, but captured with a high resolution oscilloscope with lower noise and better uh, E knob of over 7 bits. So notice how the baseline noise is heavily reduced as compared to the previous scope measurement. The prominent periodic spikes are also much more consistent in amplitude. Using an oscilloscope with higher E knob can help in identifying uh, the problem quicker and more easily. In this case, the problem was a one megahertz uh, switching noise coming from a 1.5 volt buck regulator. So, uh, of course, the scope ca cannot be used alone. You need some sort of a, uh, some sort of probes to capture uh, the voltage and current signals. So there are a range of probes that you can choose from. Um, to, to make those measurements. Normally, in this case, what you'll be using is a high voltage um, differential probe, um, like I'm pointing out over here, uh, to capture these signals. Normally, these have bandwidths up to 200 megahertz, which is more than enough for, uh, for motors running at low frequencies. Um, but however, if you have a need of higher bandwidth, we have isolated probes as well, which go up to uh, frequencies of uh, 800 megahertz or one gigahertz as well. Um, uh, so I'm going to touch touch on that a little bit later, and of course we need a current probe to capture the current. So we have a range of current probes available from uh, measuring uh, up to from 30 amps all the way up to um, uh, two kiloamps as well. Uh, so you have to choose the right probe to be able to make your measurement, and once that's chosen, you can go ahead and connect it to your system to to do the measurement. So uh, that's a really important point. Um, just talking about the importance of using a differential probe for power measurements. Uh, I touched on this a, a bit on one of the previous slides. So standard oscilloscopes, as you might know, can only measure in reference to ground. So if there's no ground reference, a differential measurement is required. So uh, a simple um, uh, half bridge configuration of, of uh, transistors is shown over here. But you can see that the potential at the high voltage DC bus on the top is plus 200 volts versus minus 200 volts at the bottom. Um, so if you if you want to make a measurement between points A and B, um, you have to make you know you can't make it with a single ended probe because the output uh, uh, at um, at point B is going to have some voltage potential. So you can't use the ground to to connect to that. So uh, using a differential probe in this case is ideal, and that's what we, that's what we recommend. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, uh, impact of galvanically isolated measurements. Uh, and the reason I'm talking about this is because silicon carbide and gallium nitride semiconductors are being incorporated into uh, many designs nowadays, which have uh, higher DVDTs and uh, making measurements on such devices. It's always been difficult as probes don't have adequate bandwidth and column mode rejection ratio specifications uh, are not favorable. Uh, so this probe is very useful in applications that you could ha have high common mode voltages um, uh, or high frequency common mode interference, um, high EMI environments, um, and so on. Uh, generally, all the probes, whether passive or active, they may have good common mode rejection ratio at lower frequencies uh, near to DC, but as soon as frequencies increased uh, above um, 100 megahertz, a few hundred megahertz or, or gigahertz, common mode rejection ratio rates very sharply, and the impedance drops as well. So that really does affect your measurements. Uh, using optical isolation between the device and the test and the scope ground, um, the ISOVIEW probe, uh, make sure you can measure small differential voltages in the presence of high common mode voltages without loading the device in the test. Uh, since the ISOVIEW system has no electrical connection from the sensor head uh, to the ground or the rest of the test system, the only common mode loading is the parasitic capacitance from the sensor head to the environment, for example, Placing the sensor head of the probe uh, six inches above a reference plane would result in about two picofarad of, of parasitic capacitance between the sensor head and the reference plane. So here's a bit of um, specifications on, on what this probe is capable of. You can get high bandwidth and high voltage 
um, uh, at the same time, which uh, which used to be quite difficult. Although the voltage does rate in some cases on some frequencies, but it is um, it provides much better uh, results as compared to traditional differential probes. And the comma rejection ratio specification is by far the best that's available in the market today. Um, so. Uh, just looking at, uh, you, know, you know, why you would use ISOVIEW to make your measurements. So this is a typical uh, simulation um, a result of a VGS signal of, uh, uh, of a MOSFET that you might be able to measure. So you have this middle plateau in the middle. But if you're making this measurement, um, uh, it, you know, it could be, it could be a, you know, it's going to be a small water difference measurement. If you make this measurement with a traditional differential probe, the problem is that the flying leads that you have, even though you can twist them and make the connection, as soon as you you move the flying lead somehow, the measurement changes. So the pink trace over here um, with about 10 to one comma mode error doesn't really show you what the actual signal looks like. So you want to capture something which, which matches your simulation and the ISOVIEW Pro because of its high comma rejection ratio, it rejects the comma mode interference. So you can see the true differential signal. And this is, this is because the tip of the ISOVIEW is shielded down to the, uh, down to the connector of the test at the test point. So you don't have any flying leads. So this, this is really useful. Um, and it solves the common mode problem. And this is a typical problem over here. So at, at 100 megahertz, most probes have 20 dB or less common mode rejection ratio um, with a, an example over here with, with a thousand volt common mode voltage. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, if, if you're looking at a 10 to one common mode rejection ratio uh, or so-called common mode rejection, uh, that basically means you're dividing 1,000 volts by 10 and you get a 100 volt error. So if you're trying to measure that 15 volt difference between the gate and the source, you can't do it. So uh, ISOVIEW has 120 dB or 1 million to 1 common mode rejection at 100 megahertz. So if you're making the same measurement using the ISOVIEW probe, the common mode error is only 1 millivolts. So for sure you can um, resolve 15 volts um, uh, of a voltage with, with that much less of an error. That's where uh, this is a really useful probe. Uh, and this is just showing the call mode rejection ratio plot uh, compared to a traditional differential probe. The Tektronix ISOVIEW starts at DC all the way, goes up all the way up to one gigahertz and it's fairly flat going up to hundred megahertz. And even, even at one gigahertz, you'll see that it's, um, it's around 90 dB of call mode rejection ratio. So it's by far the best in, available in the market today. Uh, lastly, just before uh, we move on to the live demo, I just wanted to share a interesting motor drive application um, I worked on some time ago. Um, so as you can see over here in the, in the picture, I have connected uh, the probes and uh, all the probes, the voltage and the current probes to one motor of this drone uh, and just making some static um, uh, power measurements on the scope. So what I was measuring at the time was, um, you know, looking at static measurements like RMS voltage and currents and some power um, uh, measurements, total harmonic distortion measurements, and of course, looking at the phase diagram as well. Uh, so that's it for the presentation. Uh, we're going to move on to the live demo. So I'm going to share my, um, my scope screen now. Um, so this is a scope and I'm going to set it up over here. So uh, first things first, um, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to bring up some channels over here. So channel one, two, three, four, five, and six. So I've got, I've, I've, I've connected up my configuration over here of three volts and three current probes to the drive output of this drive circuit reader is driving this brushless DC motor. So I've got um, a differential probe on channel one, channel three, and channel five, and the current probe on channel two, four, and six with respect to uh, each of the phases. So that will become clear in a bit. Uh, one of the most important things to do uh, before uh, you do anything and make your connection, of course, you can see some signals that I'm capturing already. I've done this previously um, uh, before I started capturing those signals. Uh, the first thing you have to do is make sure that all your probes are auto zeroed, your current probes are degaussed and auto zeroed as well, so that you don't have any um, uh, DC drift uh, that may appear into your waveform and cause uh, measurement errors. Uh, and the next important thing always to do is make sure that your voltage and current probe probes are de-skewed with respect to each other. So um, uh, that's really important because normally they, there'll be some propagation delay. And using our oscilloscope, you basically have the option of um, using uh, the probe setup menu um, uh, over here to, to be able to de-skew one probe to the other without using a de-skew generator. And how you do that is basically you click on uh, multi-channel. And as you can see, I've connected a 200 megahertz high voltage differential probe on channel one 
I've got a current probe, 30 amp current probe connected to channel two. And you can see the nominal propagation delay between the two probes is, um, is about 0.5 nanoseconds. So uh, th this information is fed into the EEPROM uh, on, on, the, on all of our probes. So depending on if you're using a Tektronix probe, there's always gonna be a propagation delay value that you'll be able to see. And uh, without having to connect to a DSQ generator, normally that's what I would recommend, but for a quick measurement, it's always okay to just uh, DSQ uh, your probes with respect to that, um, um, uh, th those propagation delay values that appear in in the um, uh, in the scope menu. So I've done it for channel one and two. Then I'm going to do it for channel one and three using all the same types of probes. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm back into it again. <clears throat> My bad. I have to do it with uh, the current probes. And last one. Okay, so all my probes have been uh, de-skewed with respect to one another, so I know I won't have any timing measurement uh, issues. Uh, so what I'm going to go and do, go and do next, I'm going to bring up the measurement menu. Uh, I'm going to go into IMDA, and over here, I'm going to choose my wiring configuration. So in my, in this case, you know, there are two different measurement types that you can have. You can have AC to AC industrial or DC to AC uh, or uh, inverter. So I'm, I'm choosing AC to AC industrial, uh, with, with, which has various wiring configurations, as you can see, a one phase two wire, one phase three wire, three phase three wire, and three phase four wire. In my case, I'm using three voltage and three current probes. So I choose this one. And then I simply go and um, click on power quality. So once I do that, you'll see that uh, the scope sets up and brings up some, some extra plots on the screen. You can see a phaser diagram as well, uh, but no measurements at this point in time. So if I double tap uh, the uh, measurement badge over here, I can go into the configuration and that's where I have to specify what my voltage and current sources are. So in this case, my, my phases or lines are basically denoted by A, B, and C. So, in, and I'm making measurements between line to line voltages. I don't have a neutral, so I'm not measuring between neutral. All my uh, voltage probes are connected between the three phases in the line to line fashion. So I've connected um, uh, VAB to channel one, VBC to channel three, and VCA to channel five, and the corresponding currents IA, B and C are connected to two, four, and six channels, uh, respectively. Uh, one of the things that you have to make sure of is that uh, use an edge qualifier to make some good reference measurements. Uh, when you're making those measurements, you don't need a special trigger to be able to trigger on a specific signal and then make those measurements. However, uh, all these measurements need to be made in a cyclic fashion. So what you basically tend to do is that you choose one of the sources um, as a edge qualifier. And what you can then do is you can apply a, uh, a filter to it and you can do a low pass filter uh, in, you, in, in first order, second order, or third order with a cutoff frequency. And uh, generally what that basically does, it gives you a nice sinusoidal uh, output, uh, which uses as a reference for the zero crossing detections to be able to make cyclic measurements. Uh, the reason we provide um, three types of um, uh, low pass um, filters over here is so that because if you have a really noisy signal, uh, maybe using a first order FIR filter is not going to be enough. You might still have some noise on, on the signal edges that's going to be produced. You can use a second order, a third order, uh, order filter to reduce that noise so you don't have any uh, problems with the zero crossing detection. So that's why we do that. So the edge qualifier is quite important. Uh, I want to make RMS measurements. You can you can choose RMS or magnitude. It's up to you, but I'm just going to show RMS at the moment. And once I've chosen my configuration over here, I just go back into power quality. And I use this button over here, which is called three phase auto set to set up the scope with all the signals uh, as per my configuration. So when I do that, it sets up the scope itself. And uh, in a few seconds, you will be able to see the measurements being made. Okay, so what you're seeing over here on the screen, I'm just going to arrange the windows a bit so you can get a better view. Uh, you've got the waveform view over here. So you've got the channel one PWM signal that's line to line um, between between phases A and B, then the corresponding uh, current of channel two and so on. So you've got three pairs and you know, all the voltage and current 
captures from all the three phases. Uh, what you see over here, this uh, M1 waveform, which is a math channel waveform, you see this nice sinusoidal wave. This is basically that uh, edge qualifier I was talking about in the configuration menu. So I've chosen um, the first order filter, uh, and I've chosen the edge qualifier channel one, and it applies a uh, first order FIR low pass filter on it with a cutoff frequency of one kilohertz and it generates this sinusoidal output. So this sinusoidal output is going to be used as a reference to make um, measurements, all your static measurements uh, that you'll see in the badge over here. So you can see I'm already making RMS voltage and current measurements um, over here. You've got crest factor measurements and uh, frequency, uh, showing the frequency of the motor as well. So we're running at 67.2 hertz, so it's fairly slow. And then M2 and M3 over here are some extra uh, plots that come up. So if you are looking at um, uh, looking at instant instantaneous power between all three phases, you can do the V times I to get the instantaneous power, which is the M3 waveform over here. And you can also integrate that power to look at the energy, which is the M2 purple waveform over here. Um, it brings up all um, uh, the, the same traces for other um, phases as well, but it, by default that's turned off and you can turn them on if you want, but this is just for simplicity. It's really up to you if you want to do that. So what I tend to do is I'll just turn off the math channels over here because I'm, I don't want to see this information. Uh, I may not even want to see this filtered waveform. This is just for, um, uh, for a sanity check to make sure that your, your um, uh, edge qualifier is correct. So I can remove that as well. And I can now see all just, just the three phases. And if you look at the phaser diagram over here, this is a good verification point to make sure that your probes have been connected properly, because if they're not, you might see uh, the phaser diagram a bit messed up. So if you look at the three voltage vectors over here, you can see that they're easily um, uh, separated by about 120 degrees. Uh, same goes for current. And over here, you're basically looking at the um, uh, the, the the angles between uh, the respective line to line voltages and associated line currents. Uh, normally in this particular case, when you are making a line to line um, uh, configuration measurement, um, these these uh, angles or, or oh, sorry, these line currents are not directly related to uh, those line to line voltages. So what you tend to then do is you try to make a line to neutral measurement to be able to make a much better um, um, uh, measurement of what the actual angle between the corresponding line or phase is with respect to the current. So this is just giving you the phase diagram. As you can see, I've got three voltage um, line to line voltage uh, voltages separated by 120 degrees. The currents are, are uh, look stable as well. If my connections were messed up or if they were the other way around, I will probably see uh, VCA maybe swapped with VAB over here and just may, it will probably be showing a current with IA and so on. So this is a good sanity check to make sure that um, your probes have been connected properly and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, now, at, at the moment, you can see I'm only looking at RMS voltage and current measurements. I don't see any power measurements. That's because we're in line to line mode and in line to line mode. Um, yeah, as I said, because the voltage, uh, voltage, uh, voltage and current uh, vectors are not directly related to each other. You really can't um, appreciate power measurements for that. So for that, you need to convert line to line to line to neutral. So you can quite easily do that. So uh, you can go into the scope uh, measurement menu over here and you have this checkbox over here, which is line to line to line to neutral conversion. You can use this and what the scope basically does in the algorithm in the background is it assumes a balanced three phase system and uh, it, it, um, uh, it assumes what the neutral is going to be and makes per phase measurements. So as soon as I turn this on, you'll see that now I have measurements for true power, reactive power and apparent power and power factor as well. And you can see that reflected on my phaser diagram as well. Uh, I have uh, a fairly resistive load over here, as you can see, because my power factor for each phase is nearly one. Um, so so it's, um, it's quite nice to look at that. And now if I look at the uh, phases, um, the voltage um, phase versus uh, the current phase angles, these are more uh, relatable. And you, you, this is going to be a correct value. Hence, the power measurements and the power factor uh, measurements are correct as well. So you can, these are static measurements you can make uh, on the oscilloscope. Uh, one other thing that you can do, as I talked about in the slides, is you can go into uh, measure and um, you can click on the IMDA option. You can go into harmonics. So if you want to make harmonic me harmonics measurements, you can easily do that. In this case, you just have to configure um, 
your connections again. So I'll do it the same way I did for power quality measurements. Um, you can easily save a setup if you do these tests very often. Um, choose my edge qualifier, choose harmonic ranges of up from one to 40, and uh, I'll choose AIC 61000 pre-compliance uh, standard as well. So doing this, now I see harmonic measurements on the right-hand side of the screen. So I can look at the fundamental total harmonic distortion and um, um, uh, uh, other measurements over here as well. If I want to look at the bar graph of, this, um, of these measurements, I can easily do that by bringing up the bar graph from the configuration menu. And you can look at the bar graph. And these li little needle pins, the white ones that you see on the screen, these are basically the limits from the IEC 61000 standard. So you can see that my harmonics that are being measured from are up to 40 harmonics are, are all correct. And if you zoom into um, these, um, uh, these harmonics over here, you can kind of see that for each harmonic, we have three bars. And that basically means that it's one bar for each phase. And that's across 40 harmonics. You can go, you can make, you can capture up to 200 harmonics if you want, and you can make measurements across that. And if you wanted to bring up uh, a table, a results table that corresponds to um, these, these measurements, you can easily do that. So I've got the table over here, as you can see, all the different harmonics being captured, um, all the different values, magnitudes uh, being measured as well. And uh, just, just by scrolling through, you can see that because I'm making a pre-compliance measurement, you see a pass, pass, pass. Uh, on each harmonics um, uh, harmonic as well, so it's, it's it's quite good. And this is this table updates in real time. You can save this table as well. If you had your own limits that you wanted to uh, test against, you can do that as well. There's a custom filter in the configuration menu that would allow you to do that. Um, there are other measurements you can make as well, from DC ripple and so on. But I don't have that connection available on the scope over here. Um, so these are the static measurements you can make. The next thing I would like to show before we move it on to questions is the dynamic measurement capability. So for that, well, I'm going to look at the startup response of this motor with some load applied, and you'll see how, how that works. So I'm just going to recall a session file that I've saved uh, from before. You might see a white background on this, on this screen over here, because in this case, um, when, when I captured this session, I was using a white background. So I'm going to go into the motor utility over here. Uh, I'm going to stop the motor because I want to I want to capture the startup response. So once I stop the motor, I can go ahead and uh, reset its value to a thousand RPM like I did initially. So the motor is not running right now, as you can see. And, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear the results in the background of the scope. I'm going to click on single acquisition. So now I have a trigger ready on channel two to capture a high current at the startup. And uh, what I'm going to do now is simply start the motor. And I'm capturing uh, a lot of data over here right now. So that's 10 seconds worth of information. Uh, lo loads of data is going to be captured. So bear with me. You will see um, some measurements being made in real time over here. And uh, the results will take a little bit of time to accumulate. There's 10 million points of, of data per channel that I'm capturing. Okay, so what you can see over here um, on the top, what I did was I overlaid all my three phase voltages. So the, the top trace over here shows all the three phase voltages overlaid on one another. And, uh, and, at, the and, and the, at the bottom, you can see that I've overlaid all my current traces. And the measurements that you're seeing over here uh, uh, on uh, the, 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 the three grids on the bottom are basically time trend plots. So this is basically measuring the RMS voltage and currents and how these are changing uh, over time, and these are time synchronous to the captured waveforms. So at the start of uh, of the acquisition, for example, I can bring up a cursor and uh, and uh, easily easily show how this measurement is being made. Uh, this is moving on. There you go. That's the cursor. So um, if you if you look at it, and if I move the cursor over here, I am looking at the um, uh, the RMS current for phase one. In this case, so you can see at this point in time when the motor started up, it was at 254.36 uh, milliamps. And as the time progressed, um, and you know, maybe there was some load applied to the motor, it slightly, slightly decreased to 202, and then I applied some load, and then the current increased. Uh, it went up to a maximum of 310.5 uh, milliamps. And then when I took the load off, 
um, it basically went back into its startup uh, condition. And then I put applied some load again and went up to uh, 191 milliamps. And then I took the load off and it went back to its steady state condition and stayed flat all the way uh, at about 73, 73 milliamps. So you can capture a long acquisition and look at how your measurement changes over time. So I'm looking at RMS voltage and currents for each of the three phases uh, in this case. And the next thing you can do, uh, you can turn on the zoom over here. And when you turn on the zoom, um, you basically are looking at the startup response of this motor. So if you look at the full acquisition on the top, I'm looking at the startup. And now I can pan through um, my acquisition and see how my three phase measurements are changing with respect to time as well. So you can see as I do that, I'm getting newer measurements on the power quality on the right hand side. And my phaser diagram is being updated as well uh, as we go. And you can also see the time trend plots uh, being updated for that particular window. And you can see how, so that's changing over time. So you can do this for uh, up to any point uh, within, uh, within the acquisition and look at what your waveform uh, or your motor's response was at that particular point in the acquisition. This is a really powerful feature. You can't do this with a power analyzer uh, with an oscilloscope. This is easily done. Okay, so uh, that was it uh, for for the demo. I'm now going to move it back to uh, the presentation screen. Okay, and we can open it up for questions. Thank you, Omar. Um, so with the time left, we'll um, turn our attention to the Q&A section um, of the webinar. So please keep your questions coming. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, please post them to the to the panelist. Um, and if we do run out of time, um, we will follow up with, with um, questions or the answers to the questions via email. Um, so Omar, first question um, is, can I save data in the form of a PDF for a report? You can indeed. We have a uh, report uh, save function on the scope that allows you to come to save the report in 3DF format, which will include all your measurements that you made, uh, all the screenshots uh, and all the plots and everything else. So, yeah, you can do that. And another question regarding saving data. Can I save acquisition data, a trend data in the form of a CSV file? You absolutely can. Yes, so you can use that for offline processing. Brilliant. Um, what is the specification of your high voltage differential probe used in the demo? Uh, so in this demo, I was using a THDPO 200. It's a 200 megahertz bandwidth uh, probe and can measure up to 1.5 kV uh, differential. Um, next question. Do you use any Rogowski current probes? And if so, what's the maximum current range? So, uh, yeah, we do have Rogowski current probes. Uh, the ones that we have, there are two models. Uh, the maximum current range that you can get from one of those models is uh, two kiloamps. Um, and the last question I can see at the moment is, um, what is the maximum sensitivity and current range of the current probe used in the demo? Right, so as I mentioned during the slides, I used a TCP-0030A probe over here, which is a 30 amp current lamp. And it's quite uh, okay for this sort of um, uh, setup that I have over here on my desk. Uh, I can measure ma maximum up to 30 amps and the highest sensitivity on it is 1 milliamp per division. So you can really uh, put it down to maximum sensitivity to look at uh, small current changes. 